Uh, district public advocate and running for the school board. And first of all, uh, the incoming superintendent, Paul Myers, uh, you made a contract with him, and I believe it's uh, the utmost importance that you release his contract and benefits to the community. In my opinion, we are lopsided in terms of what the administrators make and the preparity to our teachers. And so I think that it's about time that we start making this public information in a transparent um, alignment with what his contract is, if he gets annuity, if he gets a car allowance, if he gets mileage reimbursement, his salary, uh, and other benefits. Uh, and that goes for the same for uh, Dr. Bernie DeBray. Uh, this district owes him probably about $725,000, according to my calculations, in vacation and sick pay. And I think that the taxpayers want to know where it's going to come from. This board has a clear and concise fiduciary responsibility under Chapter 162, the revised state statutes. And I keep hearing from our C, uh, CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, gloom and doom of finances. It's always me, 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 wanting and wanting and wanting uh, type syndrome. We are at a great financial level right now. We've gotten back all the amounts that we've lost due to COVID. We have record-breaking revenues from the state and from our county uh, personal property and real estate taxes. 60% of the annual tax bill collected by the county collector in December goes to this school district uh, through personal property and real estate taxes. Um, with that, you know, just be very basic on some of these um, uh, issues or contracts that we have, you have uh, instrument contracts. The contract is so very, the, the memo here is very basic, one paragraph. And I expect more from the staff that we're paying $175,000 to $200,000 for everybody behind me at this table, or more. And I expect that you put the contracts online with total transparency, that there's no insurance or no bonding associated with her memo. There's no letter of credit or assurances that we're going to get the delivery of the instruments. There's no warranty information attached, no service information attached if the instruments fail or, or aren't operating correctly, and the delivery mechanism. Are we going to go pick them up or are they going to deliver them? You have to ask those questions as board members, and I'm really embarrassed by this memo that is given to the public. Now, also, I want to address the Diversity and Awareness Committee. Uh, Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Debbie Mueller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to appear for, uh, before the board this evening. Uh, my name is Debbie Mueller, and many of you know me um, behind me. Um, I am a graduate of Fort Zumwalt. I'm also a former parent of Fort Zumwalt. Um, I have three graduates from Fort Zumwalt North and was a 30-year retired teacher and administrator from Fort Zumwalt. My purpose this evening, though, however, is um, fighting for public education with these fine people for the last 30 years um, sitting behind me right here. So um, what I'd like to do tonight is just um, thank you for this opportunity to share an exciting endeavor which has been initiated by several citizens of our community. And I'm here tonight just to announce the formation of a political action committee called St. Charles County Families for Public Schools. This group is comprised of all groups, Republicans, Democrats, independents, liberals, moderates, and conservatives. We recognize the vital role of public education in our community, and the, we'd like to um, sustain the quality of life that we enjoy in St. Charles County. We believe that public education brings our communities together, and we'd like to keep it that way. The organization is originated by two former superintendents in St. Charles County, Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris and Pam Sloan, Dr. Pam Sloan, as well as a former state senator and circuit judge, Dr. Ted, or, sorry, De circuit judge Ted House. As we build this grassroots movement, we plan to raise money to support various candidates for school board elections who are committed to public education, as well as to engage appropriate elections to improve revenue and resources for local school districts. We are families who want to mobilize the vast majority of St. Charles um, Countyans who respect and appreciate our teachers and who want to support public school staff and administrators who unselfishly give themselves to achieve the educational excellence that we have come to respect. And most of all, we have committed to the students of our school districts, districts seeking to help support needed and, hope, and provide hope 
the, for our future of our children in our communities. We support the provision of the Missouri Constitution, which reminds us that knowledge and intelligence are essential for the preservation of rights and liberties of our people. And public education is the foundation of our democracy. And in particular, we strongly believe that the public funds of tax incentives should be used for our public schools. We celebrate the incredible accomplishments of Fort Zumwalt School District, and we want to highlight the variety of amazing things that go on in public schools every day. And we'd love to celebrate the wonderful people who make that happen. And we hope that you will consider us a resource to help spread the good news of this school district as well. And any way that we can help to do that, we would love to support you. Thank you. Next, we have our recognition, Dr. Myers. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Uh, two items of recognition, recognition for you this evening. Excuse me. Uh, first one is to recognize the artwork that we have around you tonight. Um, as you know, this is kind of a tradition we've done at Fort Zumwalt. Um, the schools you see represented here this evening, just to list them briefly for you, Darden Elementary, MG, JL Mudd Elementary, Lewis and Clark Elementary, Progress South Elementary, and last but not least, St. Peter's Elementary. So again, just a great opportunity to highlight the quality of the work being done. Um, you see that these are all elementary students putting that product together. It uh, really speaks to their talent and the skill level of our teachers in instructing them. So the second item of recognition that we have, Dr. St. Pierre is going to walk us through. That is recognition of our 2023 Grow Your Own Teacher recipients. And Henry, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Myers. Good evening, members of the board. Um, really excited to uh, be able to introduce three superstar seniors to you here tonight. I'm going to have them come on up. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to say about them. Come on up, girls. And, uh, and then I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. So these are our three Grow Your Own Teacher recipients from the graduating class of 2023, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, this is one of the most enjoyable parts of my job, certainly be asso being associated with this program. And, and we've had our Grow Your Own Teacher uh, program around since about 2005. Uh, the primary function of which is to identify um, some top-notch seniors who are interested in teaching in areas of high needs, special education, math, science, industrial technology, speech language pathology, areas that we typically have had a hard, harder time um, filling positions. Uh, we wanted to uh, recruit some of our graduates to come back and, and uh, who might be interested in teaching in some of those areas of high need and, and uh, give them some financial assistance through a private foundation to go to college and in exchange for that financial assistance come back and teach for us in an area of, of high needs. And by and large that money is all privately raised and uh, the recipients uh, get $4,000 per semester for up to four years to, to go to college. Um, and uh, work on that degree in a, in a teaching area of high needs, come back and teach for us. We have 17 teachers who are in our school district teaching right now who have gone through this program, very successful program, and we have another seven students who are in college, and uh, these three fine young ladies will be the newest uh, recipients of this program um, starting in the fall, so I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves to you and uh, tell a little bit about what their plans are for next year. We'll start with Cameron Boyd. Hi everybody, my name is Cameron Boyd. I'm a senior at Fort Zumwalt South High School. I'm involved in many extracurriculars and activities such as being the president of Educators Rising, A+, KPI. I'm also a mentor for a special education program at school. Um, I am also in FCCLA. I plan to attend SCA first, but then thinking about Lindenwood after SCA, and then I'm going to major in special education, preferably at the high school level. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Faith, come on up. Hello. My name is Faith. I'm currently a senior at Fort Zumwalt West High School. At my school, I'm on the varsity cheer team. I'm also a member of Jaguar Connection, and I currently am enrolled at Lewis and Clark for my second year. I'm currently student teaching in a fourth grade resource math classroom at Blackhurst Elementary School. And last year I student taught at the St. Charles Early Childhood Center in a preschool classroom with special needs kids. Um, it's really what kind of drove me to taking this path and applying for the Grow Your Own Teacher program. Uh, this coming fall I plan to attend Lindenwood and get my degree <coughs> in special education with a minor in math. 
That way, when I return to the Fortson Walt School District, I can hopefully teach in a resource math classroom. I want to thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you. And Abby Porter. Hi, my name is Abby Porter. I am a senior at Fortson Walt North High School. Um, I'm a member of the varsity wrestling, volleyball, and track team at school. I'm also involved in PPI, National Honor Society as well. Um, I plan to major in secondary education mathematics. I am currently undecided on a school. I'm looking at Truman State heavily right now. Um, and then I, mathematics, I plan to teach high school mathematics. Uh, I, something I've always loved and ever since I found out about this program in middle school, I really look forward to it. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity, Dr. Steve here as well. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have our consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda in front of you. Move for approval as presented. Mr. Callahan, second. Okay. Mr. Christopher. Sorry. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Next, we have our financial reports. Mr. Ward, Good evening, members of the board. I direct your attention to the monthly financial summary for December. Monthly fund balances for December totaled $152,591,388.87. Of that balance, $24.6 was reserved for debt service. 59.6 was reserved for capital projects. 5.7 million was reserved for our food service program. 2.6 million was reserved for our student activities, leaving 60.1 million for operations. As shown on the investment schedule, $160.1 million was invested at month end. Monthly revenues for December totaled $85,118,410.39. Um, as you may notice, that, that is by far our highest month of revenues. We get the lion's share of our tax revenue in December, so that's why it's so high for the month. As shown on the revenue report, this was comprised of $78.7 million from local sources, $5.4 million from state, and $1 million from federal sources. Year-to-date revenues are running behind last year through December by 5.6 million overall. Um, this decrease was primarily related to local property tax collections uh, that made up 11 million of that decrease. Um, the main reason for that is we actually get advances from the county, so they estimate what our revenue is. They get so much money in December, they break it up bet between the taxing jurisdictions and just estimate the payment. And then they reconcile that in January. And actually, I just got that notice today. So we are actually running $3.4 million ahead of last year after we received that payment here in January. So that, that caught itself up. The decrease was offset by increases in Prop C of a million, increases by about 900000 in interest earnings, and increases of $1.6 in local food service sales, and increases of $2.4 in state transportation funding. As I mentioned, the lower property tax collections, that was just the timing. Once they reconciled in January, we've caught up and actually surpassed last year. Um, as discussed in previous reports, the increases in other categories are all as expected and uh, based on current information and economic changes that have occurred with interest rates and sales taxes and all those things. Monthly expenses for December totaled $22,984,101.17. As shown in the expense report, payroll-related expenses totaled $17.3 million for the month. Purchase services, $3.9. Supplies, $1.4. And capital construction was $500,000. Expenses for the month are running ahead of last year at this time by about $3.8 million. Salary and benefits are running ahead by $1.1 million and are as expected for this time of year based on changes in compensation and staffing. Purchase service costs are also up for the month compared to last December. The majority of that increase was related to an insurance claim of a half a million dollars. We had pretty significant flooding in the lower level of South High, you guys may recall, back in the summer. And that cost to reconstruct was 500, actually plus. This was a payment, this is kind of a first invoice that we paid. There's, there'll be some follow-up, but that's one of the major variances for this month. That increase was partially offset by some lower tuition expense. We've had quite a few more students returned in-person learning. They're not doing the full 
full virtual link program any longer, so we're seeing a, a pretty good decrease in, in our tuition costs because of that. And I mean, I, it's not listed here, but we are also seeing an increase in our special ed out of district placement. So there was a little bit of offset in, in tuition costs, but overall the net effect was a decrease. Supply type costs are also up for the month by 14% or 170,000. And that was led by increased spending in just general supplies across the board and technology. Uh, a lot of that was driven by student activities. We are seeing an increase in our student activity spending in the last month. And lastly, we have capital spending is up slightly as we have completed more bond funded projects this year than we did last year at this time. And the last thing I want to note is I had brought you a COVID kind of uh, stimulus report, the, the not last, I think it was last month. I didn't really bring one this month. There wasn't a lot of spending, additional spending this month, but I will bring you that back to you next month to show you what we spent out of our, uh, the money that we got from the federal government in October. Anybody have any questions? If there are no questions, I need a motion to approve the financial reports. Move for approval as presented. Mr. Callahan, second. Sure. Mr. George, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. Under old business, um, we have two items. Our first one is an update or a review by Lisa Kester. Um, as you may remember, uh, part of the bond issue included passage of items related to purchase of band equipment. And Lisa has prepared bids that she's going to bring and go for this evening. So, Lisa, if you want to do that. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Um, members of the board, as Dr. Myers has said, we had, I worked with Jesse Bowman in purchasing, and we met with the instructors at the high schools uh, and middle schools um, to see what their needs were. And we kind of put together, assembled a big list of things that they needed to replace or needed for a, a little bit of uh, growth that they've had. So, we assembled that list. And um, Jesse put together a bid package, and I believe she sent it out to, I don't want to say 15 to 20 vendors that were in her list of musical providers that had said they could provide something. Out of that, she got four vendors back that bid on some, not all. Everybody has their own uh, specialty. So out of that, she went through all of those and line item by line and found out who was the least, who had the best price for us that met what we needed. And that brought us to this list that's attached, um, and then I summarized. So we have uh, awards that need to go to four different vendors for instruments, and this should take care of um, the secondary schools and bring them current on what they need. So with that, I need your approval. I'm assuming on each line item, just one? one? Okay. Does anybody have any questions regarding? Thank you. If there's no questions, we move forward with a motion to approve the instrument recommendation as presented. Motion. Mr. Helm, second. Mr. George, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Second item, um, as you all know, the board has several committees that are operating this year, and we felt this would be a great opportunity um, for the board to hear an update from each of the committees, but in addition, give an opportunity for the community to hear what's going on and some of these very important initiatives that are being done. Um, so we've asked each of the community reps to do a very brief summary. Um, so this will be a snapshot view, not a, not a full uh, in-depth look at it. Um, but we'll start off with diversity and awareness. Mr. Moore, you want to start us off? Yeah, just stay here. Um, thank you, Dr. Dr. Myers. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a folder up there for you with uh, really just what the committee has been working on. We had three three meetings thus far. Um, as you know, uh, Mr. Juan Wilson is our <coughs> the coordinator for the district. He, he and Melissa Tishy are leading the committee, and then I am acting as a district office liaison. Uh, we have about 30 members on the committee. Uh, I think that's the first uh, piece of paper I gave you there, just with, uh, with the context. It's a, it's a range of we have board members, uh, district office administrators, building administrators, teachers, uh, parents, and, and students. We've had some students that, uh, that have attended as well. Um, so we met, like I said, we've met three times. We met in uh, October was our kickoff meeting. 
um, at that one, um, like I said, about 30 members. Uh, what we really tried to do there was get an in, try, try to gauge the interest of, uh, of the uh, committee members that were there and uh, had, had a brief kind of survey that we put out to them. And then, and then from that point, we, uh, Melissa Wan and I kind of worked on really three components or subcommittees that then we have kind of divided out um, amongst, uh, uh, amongst the larger committees. So what, we're, what really we have focused on is kind of the three components of uh, um, staff awareness, staff uh, uh, awareness and education, professional development piece, uh, parent engagement and student involvement. So uh, from there, we, like I said, we've separated some folks out. At our November meeting, then we met with uh, with those subcommittees, and 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 really kind of had some some driving questions as to just get the discussion going with regards to current programming. You know, what are things that we're doing well at, uh, within the district, and then what are those areas that we really need to to focus on. Um, uh, from that meeting in November, we kind of generated a list that went back out to the committee, just things that we heard. Um, some, you know, kind of individually, but then also some themes that we picked up on um, that, that all of the subcommittees were kind of talking through. And one of those things I think the <clears throat> committee heard loud and clear with regards to, uh, with our staff, both certified and non-certified staff, was that, that the area for uh, professional development. Um, so, so with uh, with hearing that from them, then our last <coughs> meeting was uh, January 12th, just last week, um, met at the PDTC, and we brought uh, a couple of presenters in, um, current uh, employees with us, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Mountain from uh, Jail Mudd Elementary School, and then Angie Machalka, who is a school counselor at Pheasant Point. They are our district uh, <coughs> leaders and trainers with regards to Leader and Me. And they talked with the committee a little bit about just how Leader and Me um, while that's not within all of our buildings, obviously that we are we're trying to get that, uh, we're working to get that into all of our schools. But there is a component within Leader and Me that specifically uh, does training with diversity and awareness. So Dr. Mountain and Ms. Michalka talked about uh, talked about that to our group, and then we had uh, Dr. Jamie Wellborn, who is also um, uh, individual within our area, a trainer with the cultural proficiency. Institute, and she talked about just the work that she has done with some local school districts, um, and, and also uh, nationwide, what she has done um, uh, working with school districts and their strategic planning, their professional development uh, planning with regards to uh, with regards to diversity and awareness training. So, we are uh, well on our way. We are looking now to kind of start bringing all these things together for some recommendations that we can work with our committee on and and begin to uh, kind of shape those up and, and hopefully within uh, the next couple of months in the spring bring that uh, bring that to the board so uh, like I said uh, if you have any questions with regards to you know some of the documents that I gave you guys just to take a look at feel free to reach out to any uh, any one of us so all right thanks next up mr. Schulte I think you're taking the lead on bullying prevention tonight so uh, yes sir thank yeah. you dr. Myers member of the board um, it's a pleasure to give you an update on where we are at with the bullying prevention committee work um, we are meeting for the third time tomorrow evening with, with our membership uh, we have approximately 25 members who are serving on on the committee um, comprised of uh, middle school and high school students as well as parents administrators and then staff members including counselors crisis counselors and then and then other other personnel uh, the first two meetings have been very impactful for for the committee as we reviewed um, current state statute as well as our current policies to make sure that what we have in place as far as the board approved policy is in line with the state statute and uh, we did determine that where, where we currently stand with that policy we are in complete alignment so there's not a lot of adjustment that needs to be made there um, we also um, looked at what the norms would be for for the committee and what that decision making process would look like on whether or not we are looking for um, that consensus um, uh, approval whenever we get to that point in time when we're looking at making those recommendations during the second meeting, um, after receiving feedback from the committee as far as the, what information they would like to review, 
We have engaged in um, uh, multiple different scenarios, kind of taking that definition of what bullying actually is versus what people think that bullying is and applying that definition to a variety of different scenarios that we have seen within our school district. So we can start to wrap our head around the difference between inappropriate behavior versus behaviors that would actually meet that um, state statute and policy definition of bullying. So that was, was pretty engaging for, for the committee. Um, they also asked for current data um, from past and current school years related to the amount of substantiated bullying cases that we've seen within the district. So we provided that information and, and discussed that in small groups, and I'm sure tomorrow night we will have a <coughs> conversation as it relates to that. Um, some other interesting information they asked for um, is related to the current strategies that, that the district is utilizing within our buildings to combat bullying, to identify it, to prevent it, and then how do we respond to it once we've identified it. And I think what the committee um, discovered through that work is that there are, are definitely some areas that, that we do a great job with uh, the prevention of bullying, and we do a great job in addressing it once it's brought to our attention. Uh, but what was also evident is that there's also some opportunities that we can improve the practices that we have currently in place in order to better support um, the kids and the staff and our families, pre-K all the way through 12, because there are some differences in, in, in how we're working with those different grade spans. We also um, dove in just a little bit into some survey data that we have um, through Panorama at the elementary level to kind of get that, that student perspective on how they feel at the elementary level, how well they feel as though they fit into their school community. And honestly, from my perspective, that was, that was pretty telling, but also what was telling was just listening to our middle school and high school students and the comments that they were making as part of the discussions in, in our small groups. Those student voices at the middle school and at the high school um, level have um, been very uh, productive and very powerful in the work that we're doing. So it, it was definitely um, a great, great challenge to figure out how we can structure the committee and also get that student voice there. And I think through the elementary surveys and then having the middle and high school students on the committee, we, we've accomplished that. Um, the last thing that, that, that we looked at during the first two meetings was just looking at the forms and, and the practices that we have in place when we do receive that report of bullying. Our, our current policy has forms identified and outlined for how to um, report bullying from an employee standpoint, from a parent standpoint, from a community member standpoint, and then we also have a well-defined process in, in how we will investigate that process and, and what the steps are as far as our timelines related to once we receive that report, um, we have uh, two days to start the investigation and then 10 days to com complete the investigation and then notify families of what the outcomes are. So um, tomorrow night, what we're looking at doing is, is taking all of that information, kind of doing a quick review of everything that we've learned, answer any questions we have, and then start to develop those recommendations that will ultimately come to you um, as the Board of Education. And um, those should be based on the consensus that, that we arrive at, um, either tomorrow night or if we have a fourth meeting, if, if that's needed, we will do that. But I'm really excited and pleased with the work that, that we've been participating in. Dr. Smith has uh, co-facilitated um, the committee and has a, done a great job keeping me um, in check mm -hmm. as well as, as the committee. So thank you very much, Dr. Smith. It's a challenge. It is a challenge, <laughs> but um, she has the skill set to do it. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you have. And if there are no questions, then um, after tomorrow night's meeting, I'm sure I'll be back in, in touch with you with some recommendations. <coughs> Uh, next item, uh, courtesy and respect, Dr. Bray has an update. For the yeah, uh, we have 27 schools in the district, as you know, including the Clemens Center and the Early Childhood Center. Each one of those schools has a courtesy and respect committee being chaired by an assistant principal. 
um, and select members of the staff that are working with them on that. They are holding meetings monthly and trying to develop strategies to uh, better encourage respect and courtesy in our schools. We meet, uh, they meet monthly. We have had one meeting um, with all the chairs of those committees coming together where we could discuss uh, what they were uh, developing so that the other committees could maybe share in that. Uh, we'll have another meeting in March uh, where we'll have a second opportunity to do that. Now, one of the things we talked about at the, uh, at the meeting, the first meeting where we got all the chairs together was doing something in the spring of a district-wide nature, a courtesy and respect day or courtesy and respect, something with a courtesy and respect theme that we could make something on a yearly basis. Um, courtesy and respect is easy. Everybody knows about it, but we have to get people to use it. And we have to get staff to model it. So um, we, we did that um, prior to COVID, and we got away from it uh, probably for the last three years, and we wanted to get back into it so courtesy and respect um, had a, uh, a real meaning in the schools. Um, I see quicker uh, results at the elementary schools. Uh, it's really fun to see those little guys when uh, they have maybe poster contests or, or whatever activity they've developed for that, and it's, it's really neat to see that. Uh, as you get into the older grades, uh, you already have some, some programs in place like Positive Peer Influence and the Legal Leaders and things like that that are you know, already there to help encourage uh, courtesy and respect. I think Leader in Me, as we make that uh, available in more schools, um, that's going to really be good because they have some really good PD and, and work that we can uh, share with our teachers and to help uh, encourage courtesy and respect and, and also activities for the kids. So, you know, we just have to make it a priority again, and it is important, and um, that's what we're doing. So we won't, we won't forget about that as, as we go along. So I'll report back to you uh, in the spring of uh, if, what luck we're having with establishing some kind of district-wide uh, celebration of courtesy and respect, and uh, we'll... Uh, I think I foresee us keeping these meetings going, or the uh, committees going in the future as well. Then the last update is from the continuous school improvement planning process. That's Ms. Waters, if you want to walk us through. Sure, thank you, Dr. Myers. Um, we put together a, a steering committee um, right now. Myself, um, I'm chairing the committee along with Dr. Myers and Dr. St. Pierre. Uh, we have about 25 members on the steering committee. Um, we have put together a group of parents, teachers, support staff, um, community members, uh, business owners, chamber of commerce, uh, and board members. Uh, Mrs. Powers and Dr. Marion are also on the committee. Uh, we're also working with a facilitator throughout the process. Uh, Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris from Education Plus. She is a former superintendent of schools, um, kind of an expert in strategic planning, so she is kind of walking with us through this process. Um, we had our first meeting uh, just in December, so we really have just started the process. We're not quite as far along as everybody else is. Um, Dr. Hendricks Harris led the group through uh, the purpose of a continuous school improvement plan, which really will end up being our guiding document for the next probably at least three years. Um, we discussed kind of why we need to do it. It is a DESE requirement and will be part of the MSEP 6, and actually Mike Neal will be talking about that in just a little bit. Um, we also began discussions on our vision and mission statements, which we really haven't touched for many years. So we're looking at, at doing a little work with those as well. Uh, we'll continue all of that work at our next meeting. Um, and we've also identified data that the group felt like we needed to be able to review to kind of move forward in the process and establish kind of what our goals will be. So after break, uh, one of the the big pushes, and, and John mentioned this, was that we sent out a lot of surveys to families. We're also surveying students and teachers uh, to get all of the data that we can back um, before we start really putting together uh, the goals of this plan. 
So hopefully that data will be available by the end of the month in time for our next steering committee meeting, which is on January 25th. Um, after that meeting, uh, we'll be holding a community forum and also some staff forums uh, in the evenings and the afternoons. So we, might, we can get feedback on all of the things that we'll be looking at um, and working on. And those will be held February 7th and 8th at the PBTC. Uh, we'll take that information back to the steering committee where we will establish goals and at that point we will break up into some subcommittees and so every every one of our goals will be attached to a subcommittee that we will work through and come up with recommendations for moving forward with this plan uh, the goal is to have the CSIP finished by summer um, it is a lengthy process uh, it's going to uh, be comprised of lots of people and opinions and, and we really want to put all of that together in a way uh, that continues to move us forward as a district. So it'll really truly will be our guiding document moving forward. So um, we'll present that to you, I'm hoping by this summer. Um, we also have to present the plan to DESE. Um, we have to actually upload that into their website. They grade it and review it, and it is part of our annual performance report um, moving forward as well. So it's kind of where we are, just at the beginning stages, but it's, it's been a really interesting process. Um, a lot of good work has already been done, and we've already gathered a whole lot of data. So. We're excited for that next meeting, which will take place January 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New business. Um, first item under new business is the 2023 computer refresh recommendation. JB Medi is going to go through that with you. Um, just anticipating a question. What he is bringing tonight is the quantity, um, so we're not going to ask for approval on the dollar amount yet, uh, just the form of these, and then we'll come back at a later point with the amounts. JV, you want to take it away? All right. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so as, as Dr. Myers mentioned, this is step one of three in our process to purchase devices for this summer. Um, as part of this, what I've presented to you this evening is an overview of our four-year plan. Uh, we keep all of our devices that are in the hands of our students and teachers on a four-year refresh so that we can make sure they have the best technology available to do their job and to learn effectively every day. Um, with that, this summer we are looking at year B, summer 2023, a total of 4,780 devices. Based on our review of what we've replaced in the past, this would be a replacement of four years ago. Um, fairly similar to what we've done previously. We're covering tech ed in our high schools and middle schools, performing arts journalism. Um, we have all of our Chromebooks for our incoming ninth graders and sixth graders. Um, we have uh, some iPads that we're, we're looking to deploy. We have our, our desktops for our support staff. Uh, we have so a whole set of cafeteria machines that need to be replaced for our cashiers. And then we have at the, the, at the other thing that's in here would be elementary teacher iPads. This is a result of our review of elementary classroom technology over the past year. Um, it's become evident that we need to be providing iPads for our teachers to be more mobile in the classroom and take advantage of newer resources. Our hope with this, and I have listed 577, that's our full count of elementary teachers. Our goal though is to ask teachers that are willing and able to, um, to offer to go through a process to be trained to use these iPads the most effectively. And we don't want to force them in, our hand, in their hands all in one year. So this year we're going to make that an optional approach and work with our staff that are interested to get them fully up to speed because it will take several hours uh, of training and some time with us to really make sure they're taking advantage of that and it's not just sitting in a, in a closet not being used. We want to make sure our technology is effective. So uh, with that in mind, what I would ask is first any input that you guys have and then um, approval for me to go out and get pricing on the, these devices and I can bring it back to you to, to discuss further. Is there any talk about updating some of the iPads in the elementary level too? Yeah. Like for the cluster, I know a lot of them have the carts with it that they go in, they do different things with, they use for testing at different times, they have, um, and a lot of them are getting updated. Yep, we're going through a review process on that right now of every iPad that we currently own. Um, to some extent, we're hoping that some of these devices 
Some of these staff already have an iPad, not a, not a lot of them, but some of them do, and we're hoping that we can reuse some of them that are still available for us to, to put in those locations. Um, once we go through an extensive review of what we have and what level we should set as a minimum, then I'll have a better number to, to be able to give to you for that. Yeah. Um, fortunately, with iPads, the, the purchase on those, we usually see like a six-week turnaround time, whereas computers, we tend to see about a four-month lead time, four to five months. So we have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to iPads to be able to come back and review that further if need be. Could you walk through like uh, an example of how an iPad in an elementary classroom would be used? Sure. So um, what we envision is that it's, it's really the teacher device. Uh, it's wirelessly connected to the laptop in the room, so they can use that instead of a smart board in a lot of ways. Um, they can be remoted into the, the teacher laptop that they have, so they can have their applications up on the board, they can have PowerPoint, or they're using something from Canvas or one of the electronic textbooks. They can walk around, they can work with the students instead of just facing the board, they can face the students, they can interact with the students, they can ask them, they can come down to one of the students and say, could you show me how to do that? And it displays up on the projector for all the, the students in the classroom to see. So it's really that bringing that interactivity to the, to the room, right? Making sure that the students can be a part of it, even those that can't, you know, we can take into account disabilities here. Students that can't necessarily come up to the front or are too shy to come up to the front, they're able to engage those, but also ensuring that the teachers have that opportunity to move around and be free from that front of classroom and really see what the students are doing on a daily basis. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Next item is an update, uh, district assessment update with Mrs. Waters and Mr. Mike Neal. I saw someone there he is behind the flag, so Jen's going to walk us through it. Yeah. Mike has promised to do a brief summary, but in depth. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Myers. Um, we do have um, the, the annual performance summary report. It is a little bit um, different than what we've had in the past because um, yes, he has not uh, released all of the information yet. So we are still waiting on the final release. That won't really happen until the spring. So typically when Mike's able to stand up here and say we got 98.1 out of 100 points, um, he really can't do that. So he's made his best educated guess because we're still waiting on some of that information. But overall, I think the, the story is a good one. Um, we were able to find enough public information where we could kind of compare ourselves to the top, I don't mean top, the largest 25 school districts in the state because for us with our um, number of kids who are in subgroups, it makes sense for us to compare to people who are like us, not um, you know tiny districts that, that aren't a lot like us. So Mike did a great job of rounding up all of that information. I guess the only <clears throat> two things that we are seeing that um, are very different from years past would be the number of students we have taking the ACT now. Um, and you may have seen that in the data. Those numbers have dropped pretty dramatically because uh, universities and colleges are no longer requiring that um, for the most part. Um, and then also uh, we are struggling with attendance um, as is every school district uh, in the state of Missouri right now since COVID, since the shutdown. So, Besides those two things, I would say academics remain strong, um, and Mike is going to condense Point. this report for you, and he has a nice PowerPoint that he has prepared. All right. We think we should do this, or did we already do that? I think we already did that. Okay. I really hate wearing this. I have a good reason for it, one being mom, the other one dad. My parents are pretty sick, so I'm trying to do everything I can. If it's distracting, or if you can't hear me, I'll be happy to take it off. I can just test myself for a week or so. so. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started then, guys. I'm really excited about this, as always. Uh, this first slide right here just kind of shows um, where we're going from MSIP 5 to MSIP 6. Um, we've been on MSIP 5 for years, ever since I've had this job. Of, uh, I guess this is my 10th year doing this. This year, we're transitioning to MSIP 6. Um, that basically means that this is, we're only going to have one year of data uh, for our APR and our classification will not be lowered due to APR this year, nor will it be lowered next year. Next year we'll have two years of data 
and then as we go on through MSEP 6, we'll always have three years of data, okay? Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, this is kind of almost like a trial run, basically. We don't even have all the data that um, we're going to have in the future. So this is how it's broken down. It's very, very similar, actually, to um, MSIP 5 in some ways and very, very different in other ways. Okay, so under MSIP 5, we've always had our achievement. We've always, you know, measured our achievement for students, our performance, okay? That's under status right now. So under status, you can see that a big, big chunk of MSIP 6 is going to be our status for all students. That's basically our achievements for all of our students. Um, I'll show you later what that looks like. We break that down by ELA and math and science and social studies. We also have that same um, metric that will measure our achievements so for our student groups. Those are the five groups that historically have underachieved in the state of Missouri. Okay, it's five groups that have lower achievement than the overall population. Um, it used to be under the MSEP 5, so here's some things that are different. When we measured achievement under MSEP 5, you had your achievement level, your status, which says this is where your kids are scoring, this is where they're at, okay? Like, for example, it's a, a different metric, but I have 88% in the class, okay? That's a status, that's where you are. Growth is a little bit different. Growth measures where did you start at the beginning of the year, where did you end at the end of the year, okay? So you could have a really low status but high growth, or you could have high status and low growth, so on and so forth. In MSIP 5, all of that was combined together, okay? You could get some points for status, you'd receive some points maybe for growth, some points for progress, maybe you could get a really, really good score. The state decided we're going to have those as separate categories now. So you're, you're going to get, we're going to get status points, and then also we're going to get growth for, uh, points for growth and or progress. Okay, we don't quite know what that's going to look like yet. We, within one year, we've already had three iterations of MSIP 6 that has been uh, handed down to us. <laughs> so we're kind of on the third one, and that's still up in the air because they've retracted all of that, and we're kind of waiting to see what happens. So that's why those numbers are in red right now. We don't, we do not have that data at this time. We're waiting on the state to give that to us. Success ready is almost exactly the same as it was before. Um, you have your uh, college and career ready assessments, which is mostly your ACT, and you have your college and career ready um, advanced coursework, which is AP and college credit and things like that. Graduation rate, which is self-explanatory, and we have our grad follow-up. The performance standards are like the differences and similarities I just explained. That was basically what MSIP 5 was. Now we have another <coughs> set of standards called named continuous improvement standards. That is our improvement plan, our self-study, our survey. Those are all things that, that we're not, we're working on, but that we're not getting measured on this year, okay? Documentation, is simply turning things into DESE on time, like our fiscal reports or um, like our core data from SIS and things like that. We do a good job of turning that th those things in. And then we have another success ready measure, okay? That's, so performance is all about how students perform. And then the continuous improvement is more about how our district sets kids up for success. You can kind of think of it like that. So you got two different sets here. So the success ready portion of continuous improvement is about how do we make, how do we ensure that our kids will be able to perform at a high level, okay? And the success ready is made up of things such as kindergarten readiness exams, are we giving those to all of our students? Um, do we have a, do all of our middle school students have a four year plan when they go into high school? What is their attendance rate? Are we getting kids to come to school? Things like that, okay? So just a quick overview. All right, I'm going to explain this one really, really quick because we're going to have two different MPIs. You can think of MPI as a grade point average, okay? Every student that takes the math test is either going to land in the below basic category, the basic category, proficient, or advanced category, okay? And under the old MPI that we've been using for years, under uh, MSIP 5, um, if you were in the below basic category, the student received 100 points. A basic is 300 points. 
proficient 400 and advanced 500. Okay, so just like, you know, a, a grade point average. Uh, instead of uh, being on a, like a four point scale on a five point scale, it's on a 500 point scale, all right? And it works the same way. I'll add up all your students, you know, and, you know, basically divide by how many students you had, add all those numbers up, divide by the number of students you have. Well, that's pretty decent measure, actually. It's a pretty good metric if you have a lot of students like we do, or if you're measuring the state's overall achievement. But when you start trying to compare grade levels or compare buildings, which we do all of that, uh, becomes not real precise, okay? Because that below basic range is actually pretty wide. Okay, so just giving everybody a hundred for the as if they scored exactly the same, it really isn't probably appropriate. And likewise for the other um, performance levels. So the state has changed it moving forward. Now it's a content it's called continuous MPI, and students can get a, a whole range of point values uh, in that continuum within each one of those areas, except for the advanced category, which everybody gets 500. I wish they would have spread that out also, but they didn't. But it's just a more precise measure. It allows us to better compare grade levels, better compare buildings, better compare districts by grade level and things like that. Um, so you'll see both of these moving forward. The state has not released continuous MPI. They haven't released MSIP 6. They haven't released the continuous MPI for other districts, so I can't uh, go on Desi's site and get that. I do have it for the districts in our county because we share data. Um, but all the, most of the comparisons I'm going to make on here are using old MPI because it's not public information yet. So even though I have it for a few districts, I can't really share it. Uh, so not a big deal because I can just go back and make the, all the calculations using the old formula and the rankings will still come out the same. They just won't be quite as precise. All right. So now let's kind of just take a look at where we are. So what we want to do tonight is just answer some questions about where we are we as a district. Um, under MSIP 6 and APR and how do we compare with other districts that are similar to us. So one thing I did was basically just looked at data for all the different districts, all the 25 largest districts in the state. I think there's over 506, uh, 560 districts in the state of Missouri. The top 25, I believe, have over 40% of the students in the state. Okay, so that's a lot of kids right there. All right. So in ELA, top 25 largest districts in the state, we ranked fourth. Last year we ranked fifth, okay? Um, Parkway and Fort Zumwalt are a virtual tie. There's almost no difference in our MPI right there. Rockwood's uh, about five MPI higher than us, and then Francis Howe about, uh, looks like about seven MPI higher than them, okay? So we scored above Blue Springs, Limber, Lee Summit, so on and so forth. So that's what ELA looks like right now. Just kind of give us an idea where we're at. It's pretty good. Um, we want to look at ELA, but now just let's look at our English, English language learners, it's that, that group of students only, and see how they perform compared to other districts across the state. You can see we're in third place in ELA with those students. So Francis Howe, then Rockwood, Fort Zumwalt, then Parkway, Melville, so on and so forth, okay? Now these are the 20, not just the 25 largest school districts, but the school districts with the, the 25 school districts as measured by their EL population. Okay, so some of these school districts might not be in the other one. That's because they have more EL kids than other districts do. So we can see we have a lot of EL students that tested this year. Um, another thing we look at is uh, special education students. So we're trying to look at some different subgroups. And we scored, we uh, were seventh and you can, you can see uh, that, I guess, the gap between us and Rockwood and Francis Howe there is a little bit bigger um, than it was with the overall population. Uh, we were a virtual tie with Parkway with all students, and the SPED population is contained in that group of students. But when you look at just the SPED population, there's a little bit of a gap between us and Parkway. That would mean that if we were to measure, say, non-SPED students, we would probably score a lot higher. Well, I know for a fact we'd score a lot higher than Parkway did. So we look at all of these different things. But that kind of just gives you an idea where we're at. That would be an area where we might need a little bit of work. Uh, I know that, we're, that we are working on that. Uh, it's definitely not bad, though. Um, and this is just our, all of our student groups combined. That's black, Hispanic, EL, um, free and reduced lunch, and special education. Just combine all, that, all those students into one group. That's what MSIP measures. So we were fourth overall in ELA, but we're third overall 
with um, the subgroup. Okay, so compared to other districts, you know, not too bad. So now let's move on to math real quick. Math actually looks a little better. Um, of all the districts, 25 largest districts in the state were second to Francis Howell, um, and only three MPI away, a virtual tie with Rockwood, Wild well, Square, Blue Springs, Lee Summit Parkway, Winsville, so on and so forth. Um, so pretty happy about that. So we'll move on from that. Let's look at how we did um, if we look at English language learners in math. And again, uh, behind Francis Howe, second out of 25 school districts. So again, pretty good. Move on a little bit more. Let's look at uh, special education. Again, we rank seventh in special education. So you can kind of see that um, now Rockwood jumped up to first on that. Francis Howe dropped some spots. We were three points, I think, away from Francis Howe um, when we looked at this uh, with overall population. It looks like you know, there's a, about a 15-point gap with our SPED students. So again, that's something that we would recognize as, okay, you know, here's where we can really, you know, there's an opportunity for growth for us. The good thing is anytime one of the subgroups is an opportunity for growth, it affects both your subgroup and your overall population because they're in your overall population. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone right there. Um, move on to um, student groups. And we were, were right behind Francis Al again with student groups, and I guess Blue Springs jumped up above us with student groups. So third in student groups. So overall, I mean, pretty good. Largest 25 school districts. I can tell you this, um, let's go back to math. I can tell you this because I was a math coordinator for years. And um, when I first was a math coordinator, went right around the first, you know, throughout my tenure as a math coordinator, when I first started, we were so far behind Francis Howe and Rockwood in math, it would have literally been a pipe dream to ever believe we could ever even come close to scoring as high as they, they are. And I could run that data if you ever want to see it. Go all the way back maybe 12, 15 years ago. I, you know, it was almost like, oh man, those kids, they must really have some smart kids over there, I mean, compared to what our scores were. And it's just, every time I see us outscore Rockwood, especially in math, because I was a math coordinator, it just blows my mind because we were, we were 50, 60, 70 MPI behind them. It was not even close. So we've made a lot of, a lot of great strides in our district in the last, I'd say, 12, 15 years. We really have. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and move on, sorry. I just had to say that because I get excited sometimes, all right? Um, so third in student groups, and now what we'll do, and I'm really only touching, you know, we're just only looking at the tip of the iceberg and all the different data we have. We break this down by, every single building in the county, all the different subgroups in the county. We look at growth, we look at all kinds of things. Teacher groups, building groups. We, we actually shared um, all of our item data, which tells us exactly how every building did on every single standard, um, on every single item on the map test countywide, and we even included Rockwood and Parkway so we could get a better understanding of like, what are the specific things that maybe we're relatively weak and strong on. So that's really interesting stuff. I can't share all that tonight. Um, anyway, so now we're just going to look at county data. And although I have the new MPI, I use the old MPI because it's, it's like I said, it's not public information yet. So it wouldn't be right to use that um, in a public forum yet. Um, but this looks at the different grade levels. So now we're comparing by grade level. And you can see that in third grade in the county, uh, we rank third in ELA. And fourth grade, uh, we're second, and the gap there is a little bit closer. Um, fifth grade, second. Sixth grade, second. Of course, Francis Howell is, you know, leading the pack. They were uh, the highest in the uh, out of the 25 districts, so that kind of makes sense that they're up there. Uh, look at six. Uh, did I skip one? Nope. I did. Fifth grade, sixth grade, both second in both those grade levels. Seventh grade, second. Eighth grade, second. So you can kind of see there's a nice little you know gap there. Sometimes it's you know 20 points, 15 points, 10 points. Okay. We get to high school, and there's almost very very I won't say almost no gap at all, but there's a very very small gap in high school. So we can kind of see that you know all the grade levels from you know elementary to middle school there's a pretty good gap between us and Francis Al, and for whatever reason we're a lot closer in high school. Of course that could just be you know a group of kids coming. Mm -hmm. You can see a couple years ago, 
you know, we were in third, the gap was really small, and then in 2021, the gap was larger, and now the gap's closed again, so it kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Um, if we wanted to take a look at math real quick, you can see May third grade has, has always has historically been something we really worked on. And again, this was a grade level we were light years behind everybody else a few years ago. Okay, and we've worked really, really hard to improve that. And I can't tell you the numbers for sure off the top of my head, but I I know that compared to Rockwood or Francis Howe, there were years where we were fifty or sixty MPI behind them at this grade level. It wasn't too long ago that fourth grade was actually below uh, the state average. So if you could imagine in fourth grade that red bar being to the left of that yellow one, <laughs> which is the state, that's where we were not too long ago. So again, we've made some great improvements, but we still have some work to do at elementary, as you can see, especially with the primary grades. Okay, we go. Say oh yeah, go ahead. So that the third graders there in this year, they would have been in first grade during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay, um, so we'll move on to uh, fifth grade and sixth grade. You can see there's a pretty good gap again in fifth grade. And then sixth grade, you can see, okay, all of a sudden that uh, gap's getting a little closer right there. We're not very far away in sixth grade. In seventh grade, we scored number one in the county, outscored Francis L. And eighth grade is really, really hard to compare. It's kind of weird for math because some kids take algebra one, some kids take eighth grade math. Um, some districts test all their kids in math instead of algebra one, some districts test in algebra one. So eighth grade is always hard to compare. But we're right there with Francis L, uh, not a big gap right there. Then we get to high school and we do an absolutely amazing job in high school math. We've been on top for years, the gap the last few years is really, really large in Algebra 1. Um, and you can see the same is true for Algebra 2. So if you looked at math, we were three MPI behind Francis Howe to be the top in the state for the top 25 uh, largest school districts. If you actually look at secondary math, we actually be, would be number one. And if we could just get our elementary just a little bit you know, to score a little bit higher than they are, I think we're just going to, you know, get right over that hump of probably the highest scoring district as far as large school districts in the state of Missouri. So we're we're really really right there, and like I said, we've made a ton of strides. I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to point the finger or anything. I'm just, you know, reporting the facts. That's where we're at. That that's the area we have. That's the greatest opportunity for growth is at the primary grades for us in math. Okay. All right. We'll move on a little further. With my uh, little mobile work here. There we go. So let's look at success ready students. Okay. Um, that's 20 points in, in MSIP. And so that's made up of two different things. One is the uh, college and career ready assessments, the other one's college and career, uh, career ready advanced credit. Under the assessments, the target 71.5%. It's not really a true percentage, but it is kind of loosely tied to. 71.5% of your graduating seniors get a qualifying score on the ACT or some other college career ready assessment. But it's, it doesn't exactly mean that, but it, it's close to that. It's a little bit more complicated the way they do the point system. The only, the reason we've dropped on that, we believe is because colleges and universities, many are no longer requiring ACT for entry. And many scholarships are no longer requiring an ACT score. I have a lot of anecdotal data I can tell you just about kids that I know um, that either haven't taken the ACT or the ACT simply didn't come into play for college. And we're doing everything we can to encourage kids to take the ACT. We have two test days uh, during you know the school year that we give the ACT. We offer the ACT on Saturdays. And it's just really difficult. It's not that our scores are going down, they're actually going up. It's that we used to test 1,400 students a year, and now we're testing 900 students a year, okay? And it's just really hard to get kids to take a test that maybe isn't relevant to them for whatever reason. We're addressing this this year by also having the Army recruiters come in and administer the ASVAB in our high schools. And that could be for any students that are interested in the military, or the ASVAB really is just a career ready assessment 
Um, so maybe for students that aren't interested in college or just would like to know, it's kind of like a career interest type of a test, maybe um, the kids would be interested in that. So hopefully we can get that up a little bit. We would like to see every student take some type of career um, or college or career assessment so they can kind of get an understanding of where they're at coming out of high school. As far as advanced credit, we're doing outstanding with that. And those are our advanced classes. Um, we've got PLTW, AP coursework, and, co and um, college credit coursework. I used to teach some of the college credit coursework classes where we're partner with uh, UMSOL or Missouri Baptist, and we teach a college class in our high schools. And the state standard for that is 48 points, or 47.8 percent, which is 48. I'm sorry, 47.8 percent of the graduating class finding success with one of those classes. So it's not just taking the class, it's being successful in the class, averaging a B in the class or, or getting a three or higher on the AP exam. But we're way, way above the state standard. Almost 70% of our seniors are doing that. So that's a really great uh, thing to see. This just is a little slide right here that shows the uh, total number of AP exams where we gave out over 2,000 and we have a lot more students sitting in an AP class, but over 2,000 kids this year took an AP exam in our high schools. And over 1,300 of those students were very successful on the exam, scoring a three or higher. So kind of a little breakdown there by the different buildings. And uh, it's kind of a, we, we've tried to push as many kids to, to try and take those classes, and we're still, and kids are still having great success. So, most of the content areas, we break this down by content area and subject by obviously, and we're well above the national average as far as how kids do on those assessments in those content areas. Okay, uh, attendance and graduation rate. Let's get graduation rate out of the way first, I guess. Our graduation rate's great. Um, we're above 92%, which is the target, and we've been above that since 2019. Um, you actually can get points for doing that on your five-year rate, six-year rate, or seven-year rate also. We used to get it on our five-year rate, then 2019 on, we were getting it on our four-year rate, which is better. Attendance, attendance is a tough one. Um, every district I've talked to, I've talked to many districts across the state this year, everybody's struggling with attendance. Um, I know it's a statewide problem, I know it's a county-wide problem. Uh, I've had People just from our county, just within the last week, emailed me asking me about attendance. Um, it's a nationwide problem. You can read about it. Something changed after COVID, and it's not that all kids aren't coming to school. It's just that there's a percentage of kids that just aren't coming to school as much as they used to. And I think part of it also is we've made it easy to stay at home and get your work done because you can go online and you know you can do a lot of your work online and things like that. So. Um, we're doing every. I'm, I can tell you right now, we're doing everything we can. All the superintendents get an update on tenants daily. Um, I've got all kinds of tables on uh, something called Pulse, where we can look student by student and see which students were, where are you know. We know what every single student's attendance is. I actually ran data today that I'm hoping to show to parents that shows the correlation between reading achievement in our own district this year and attendance. And it's very clear, 90 to 95, here's your achievement. You know, uh, you go down to, you know, or I'm sorry, 95 and above, here's your achievement. 90 to 95 is here, 80 to 90 is here, and so on and so forth. It, we ran the data, just steps right on down, achievement and growth. Um, when students are in school, they read, they learn to read better. You know, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna run that data on everything that I possibly can, and hopefully principals can use that but it's just a tough one. We don't, we're doing everything we can. I don't know what else we can do. Maybe someone has ideas. Um, so now, uh, JB, can you bring up that um, MSIP calculator? Okay, so this is gonna be a little bit hard to see, but this will give you an idea of where we, at, uh, we are, where we are at regarding our MSIP score. So we talked about this before. There is an academic achievement portion that we call status for all students in our students groups. Now here's some really positive data. According to the state, the target, this is what you hope for, not necessarily what the state expects you to do, but what you hope for. What your goal is, is to be at 400. Well, we're above 400 in ELA, math, science, and social studies. We've already hit the target, first year. 
we're above where the state wants us to strive for with our, our all of our students, which is awesome, okay? With our subgroup, the target's not quite that high, but with our subgroup students, um, we are in a category called on track. So you've got, you hit the target, on track is where you're expected to be, and then you have approaching and floor. We are on the target at ELA, math, and science, which is good, and we're already, I'm sorry, we're on track. Did I say on track? We're on track with ELA, math, and science. That's the second highest category. And with social studies, we already hit the target. That's with our subgroup students. Okay. We don't have growth yet, so that's not figured in. So you can see the points over there. We've got uh, 32 out of 32 points for all students and 12 and a half out of 16 for the student groups. Okay, that's what it looks like when, when APR comes out. I believe that's what it will be. Um, for Got to get a little closer so I can see. So for success ready students, um, those percentages I showed you that got us five points um, for basically ACT, the assessments, and then 10 points um, for the advanced coursework. Again, we're working to improve the assessments as much as we possibly can. Okay. Um, graduation rate, we've got all 10 points out of 10 for that. Um, graduate follow up. We survey kids to see what they're doing after they get out of high school. We got four out of four points for that. Uh, can you scroll down a little bit, Jamie? Thank you so much, sir. Um, you can see all the things that we aren't doing right now. Um, for the completion, like I told you, everything, our documentation, we do, we turn everything on time. So we got all six points for that. Um, we have the kindergarten readiness assessment. We tested over 95% of our kindergartners. That's 100% of our points. ICAP is simply um, getting a four-year plan for all our middle school students as they go into high school. Every single middle school student had a plan, so we got all of our points for that. Attendance, we got half of our points. Uh, we just talked about attendance. It's a, it's a struggle. But we did get some bonus points that they have an opportunity to earn two more points for tech ed expansion, and we got those uh, extra two points for expanding our tech ed program. So as a result, that resulted in 100% of points for that whole entire success rate category. And out of the 110 points that we know are possible right now, we earned 101.5, which is about 92.3% of our points. So again, that's not official. <laughs> they could have a fourth iteration of uh, APR that comes out here in a week, I don't know. Um, but from what we've been told, that's, that's where we're at now. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, no problem. Thank you. Yep. That was fun. I needed an approval for the district assessment update. That was more Stucky Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next item is a resolution for board member elections for April 4th, 2023. Um, as you know, we will have three vacant seats for that election. And therefore, we have a resolution I'm going to ask the board to adopt um, and approve tonight. And if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to read it out loud because it is a resolution. So, uh, resolution calling for the election of three three year term directors of the Fort Zumwalt R2 School District. Whereas the Board of Education of the Fort Zumwalt R2 School District has determined that there will be three three-year term vacancies on the board in April 2023 to be filled at the April 4th, 2023 election and whereas the district wishes to notify the election authority of St. Charles County, Missouri of the individuals who have filed a declaration of candidacy with the district seeking to fill said vacancies at said election. Now therefore be resolved by the Board of Education of the Fort Zumwalt R2 School District as follows. Item one, that the election on Tuesday, April 4th, 2023, there be submitted to the voters of the district the election of three three-year term directors of the Fort Zumwalt R2 School District. Item two, that notice of said proposition be given to voters of the district by the election authority of St. Charles County, Missouri, as required by law. And item three, that a proposition in substantially the following form be included on the ballot and submitted to the voters of the Fort Zumwalt R2 School District at said election. On the official ballot, there will be the following seven candidates, Arnie C. A. C. R. Dinoff, 
Greg Steven Sartorius, Mark Pratt, Erica Seth Powers, Michael A. Smith, Matthew Richard Graham, and Catherine Kate Bird. And then following instruction to voters, um, we'll read, you may vote for three, punch a hole on of the candidates of your choice. And then the remaining four, remaining items, item four, that the election authority shall certify the returns of the election herein provided or to the secretary of the board who shall record the same and report the results to the board. Item five, that the secretary of the board is hereby authorized to and shall forthwith file with the election authority a certified copy of this resolution for its information and guidance in order that the election authority may take such action as may be required of it under the rules and regulations and the laws of the state of Missouri in connection with the election herein provided for. And item six, the resolution shall take effect and be in full force immediately after its adoption by the Board of Education of the Fort Dumal R2 School District, therefore adopted by the Board of Education of the Fort Dumal R2 School District, St. Charles County, Missouri, this 17th day of January 2023. Thank you for tolerating that reading process for me. Um, and I would ask for an approval of that. Okay, I need a motion for approval. Callahan, second. Elms? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right. All right. And last item under new business does not involve reading. Um, <laughs> just asking for the, board, the board's permission to reschedule our February 20th, 23 board meeting to February 21st. 2023 um, in observance of President's Day holiday. I need a motion to make the change. Right. Mr. Christopher, second. George. George, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Lastly, we have comments from the Board of Education. I will start with you, Mr. George. Oh, uh, I'm happy to see that. Uh, we're doing well with our grow our grow your own teacher and he said 17 we're already through seven in college and uh, i guess there's just the three <coughs> upcoming hopefully there's some more in the pipeline too but uh, kudos well done <coughs> uh, attendance problems i don't know uh, i think that's across the board we're having that issue at work as well i don't know gabriel you probably don't have it as much because somebody's got a call and swap out or whatever <clears throat> but uh, I don't know uh, where we can go with that one that seems to be an, a, a problem everywhere uh, thanks for everybody coming out tonight and uh, take it easy thank you Mr. <clears throat> uh, well uh, grow your own teacher programs awesome program glad to see that keep going uh, we want to thank several people tonight Everybody on these uh, committees, you're doing a great job. Keep it going. All the information and the hard work you're doing is going to certainly pay off. Um, Mike Neal, um, numbers maniac. He approaches more numbers in a month than we all do in a lifetime. And uh, it's really, really hard to understand, but it's so valuable. And uh, so he just does an excellent job, and I'm proud of him. Just wish everybody a happy new year and look forward to a great year and keep doing what we're doing and improve on what we're doing. Thanks. Yeah, kind of uh, along the same lines, uh, the committees that we've started, uh, we've got community involvement, we've got staff involvement, we've got student involvement. That all these different parties involved in that, I think that's is really good. And we're going to see some really good outputs coming from that. We're really looking forward to seeing those in the next few board meetings coming out of, of some things that we can start working on and applying from all the discussions we've been having. It's been really, really good. I've been really proud to be involved in that and, and learning a lot in the process of that uh, as well. So uh, that's really good. Um, yeah, the data and achievement, I, it's always fun to sit and listen to and be able to talk about all that but uh, what's what's really great about that it shows us where we're at it shows us where we've been and it shows us where we're going right you can use the data to help help guide us and then what we're doing and it's really good to see that we're doing really good and it shows us the areas that we need to keep working on and really good to see that 
And uh, yeah, the Grow Your Own Teacher program has always, always been really good. Uh, such a great community support around that and uh, something uh, that's a success. And, and I, I, I do agree, I hope it's more than just three <laughs> for this year as we go along. So. Mr. Helms? Um, first, thank you to the students who provided us with all the nice artwork again. It's growing. So uh, it's, that's awesome. Uh, congratulations to the three students who also uh, were part of Gory Home Teachers, as everybody already said. I'll just read it again. I think that's, that's definitely one of the highlights of this district. And, uh, and I think the participation also really makes it the highlight of that just that it's here. It's, people are taking advantage of it. Um, as far as the committees go, thank you to everybody involved from the teachers, students, staff, administration, other board members as well as my colleagues. Um, you know, I know our, the progress doesn't always, doesn't, you don't always feel like the progress reflects the work we're putting in, but it, you know, it's, even a little progress is good. I think we're constantly moving forward, no matter how small or big, I think it's good. So um, just stick with it, it's a labor of love, obviously. Um, JB, thank you for the numbers on the computers. Appreciate all your hard work there. And Mike Neal, much appreciated. It's definitely one of those things that like he like, you know, like Craig said, it's it's necessary because it puts something that's intangible, makes it tangible. You can see the numbers and be able to quantify it. So much appreciated because he's a huge asset to the district. And I'll actually help. Thank you. Mr. Callahan? Uh, I'm very impressed with the uh, three uh, uh, seniors that are committed to uh, <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, grow your own teachers. Uh, their emphasis on special ed. I think that is a deeply embedded uh, need in uh, in, our, in not just our uh, school board, uh, school district, but every school district. I uh, also appreciate the work of the committees. Uh, you 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 have started a. A, a process that will help us uh, for, I think, decades. Thank you. Thank you. I second everything that everybody said here, too. The thing that I wanted to point out that I really look at a lot, and I touched on that, was the growth portion that was on there. Um, because we tend to focus on grades and what the grades are, but what was really important is are our kids growing? So when you look at that math portion and those things and you see a child who may not have been able to read very highly and they have come incredibly far, it's working, right? And that's thanks to the teachers and all the work that's put in because it's been a lot these past few years and there's been a lot of kiddos in those years that missed integral things that they needed to be able to keep going and they've had to put in a lot to get there. So I really like looking at that in the growth portion, not just number of what they did is that we've really tracked their growth and we do a really good job of that to look to see okay we are doing this part right and these kids are growing so kudos to everybody who's put all the stuff in place Jen and your team and then all the teachers who have really worked over these past few years to get the kids where they need to be and continue to do that I from the bottom of my heart I appreciate you because my kiddos are some of them that needed that help so thank you all right with that I need a motion to go into closed session um, Mr. Moore, second, Mr. Helms, roll call, please. Gabriel? Yes. Craig? Yes. Tommy? Yes. John Christopher? Yes. John Callahan? Yes. Eric? Yes. All right. You guys want to take a quick break? Yeah, we'll be back in about five minutes. <clears throat>
play college sports in order to, this is the, this and have that information out there and have counselors talk to the kids and parents and say, look, hey, this is this is the track that you're going to have to be on. If you want to go to Ivy League, you got to have this. If you want to go to Division One, you got to have this. Uh, Division Two, you got to have this. Yeah. Well, right. We are now back in open session. I need a motion to oh, adjourn. Sorry, Unless anybody has anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We're done. Like Peace.